Uh, I'm Mark Rozo, and this is Matt Turnauer, and um, we are longtime email buds, and we're finally hanging out uh, both um, with some roots at Vanity Fair magazine. Right. Matt's are probably deeper than mine. Mine might be are more recent, I guess. Right. But you're still there, and I'm no longer. Yes. So we were colleagues, but I had moved out to L.A which was actually my hometown, so I re, re moved to LA, and then Mark was remained in New York. But we've been corresponding for years, and actually this is the first time we've met in person, but we are, we are indeed colleagues, and we've covered uh, Hollywood a lot, and from, I think, <coughs> I as a native of LA, and uh, Mark as someone that is coming at it from the outside, so. I thought, we thought that would be a good way to kind of get into this. Yeah, I am interested in that because the title is, uh, what is the title? Oh, Hollywood Dreams, the, is it the allure of Tinseltown? The, the enduring allure of Tinseltown. And one Vanity Fair factoid that probably isn't allowed out of the office of Vanity Fair is that Tinseltown is on the ban list. Does anyone know what a ban list mm. is at the magazine newspaper? Yeah. Those are like a list of words that you're never to use in any, you know, article, right. headline, deck, caption. Mm -hmm. And wasn't that the case when you were there? Central as well? Town was banned. Banned. Yes. So yes. If, uh, if you ever see that term in Vanity Fair, somebody managed to pull a fast one. Also, weirdly, I want to say A-list was also banned at Vanity Fair. And legendary. Legend, which I yeah. could not agree with more. <laughs> um, celebrity, I think, was on the ban list. Yeah, it was absurd. Star, um, we're, and then I was at Gourmet for a while, and, and the band list there was really fascinating too. Fair, you couldn't say you couldn't say eatery, or serves up, and the New Yorker has a really great band list, including the word balding, That's which the old hard. editor William Sean, who some of you might remember, had a th problem with that word. Maybe he was balding he, himself. He was uh, completely bald. <laughs> yes. Uh. Um, so anyway. Um, but the allure of Tinseltown, uh, bandless Tinseltown. Yes, oh. I was really interested in the fact that, you know, I'm an East Coaster, still live in New York City. Matt um, grew up here in L.A., and maybe we could talk about the ways that we came to our own, you know, how Hollywood and Hollywood stories and Los Angeles stories more broadly kind of lured us in as storytellers. Yeah, um so I was uh, born and raised in L.A., in West L.A., and specifically Brentwood, which was kind of like, when I was a kid, um, the, the happy valley for retired movie stars, uh, like Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray, and, um, you know, everyone lived in Mandible Canyon, it seemed, and they all went to the, a place called the Brentwood Mart, where you would, if you my father was a TV writer and producer and a movie buff, so I'd be sitting there as like a four-year-old, he'd say, that's Barbara Stanwyck or that's Betty Davis, uh, or, you know, sometimes it would get really obscure, like that's Eugene Pallette, a character actor from many 30s <laughs> movies. Uh, and then he worked at Universal Studios and he wrote Columbo and Murder, She Wrote and kind of like what was called the NBC Mystery Wheel, which was very popular uh, in the 70s and through the 90s. But uh, he, I think he's the one that got me into the Hollywood because he had seen every movie and kind of uh, made me watch all these old movies, and I loved it all. And uh, But I thought, when Mark and I were talking, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about being kind of dazzled by all of that. And, you know, movies are meant, and TV are meant to really hypnotize us, and they do so effectively. Uh, it's really magic. Uh, but then, uh, I think someone who has an inquiring mind, and I did become a journalist before I became a filmmaker, and you're living in the middle of Los Angeles, you can't help but start to poke at the uh, facade. And that really is uh, the foundation upon which I built my writing career at Vanity Fair. I would often get what I called the Norma Desmond stories, which were the people who were great, great figures who were at the end of their career and were looking back and wanted to tell their stories. And I, as the way in, I often framed it using the Sunset Boulevard, the, the great Billy Wilder movie as a device, and what you found almost inevitably with all these figures, I'll name some names, uh, Robert Evans, uh, the, the great producer and infamous producer. I did this story on him uh, upon which the documentary really was inspired. It's called The Kid Stays in the Picture. Uh, 
and um, a woman named Janet de Cordova, who was the widow of Freddie de Cordova, who was the producer of The Tonight Show, uh, Merv Griffin, uh, all these people at the end of their career. And there was really a wonderful way to look at the, uh, the mythology surrounding the history of Hollywood. And often I always found it was all a facade. And uh, examining the way people, uh, these great figures, manipulated the, uh, the Hollywood myth machine to their own advantage was really uh, kind of the foundation upon which I built the work. And I went on to make a series of movies, which I'm still making, that often explores that territory. Um, so uh, Mark's written a wonderful book about the 60s and 70s in LA called Everyone Thought We Were Crazy, which is uh, also, I think, getting behind the facades of Hollywood. It's about two really important figures of that period, Dennis Hopper and Brooke Hayward and their marriage. And I'll turn it over to you so you can sort of pick up your piece of this behind the, the myths. Yeah, I'll try. I love the, 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 Norman Desmond, the Norman Desmond idea I love because I also feel like I am inclined to very similar stories of finding figures at a certain age where they might be a little bit more relaxed and ready to talk. I mean, another, you know, industry term uh, for it, which is not so... Uh, light and airy and pretty is often sometimes referred to as the exit interview. Uh, um, <laughs> but um, when you speak to an aging, somebody very accomplished in whatever field. Right. But I do find um, it's really uh, gratifying, of course, to be able to meet people that you've kind of worshipped your entire life. And also sometimes disturbing. And disturbing, yeah. yeah. And, they're re and they're ready to talk. Um, I mean... I, uh, for me, I'm not from this part of the world. Uh, I am an East Coaster. I grew up in semi-rural Pennsylvania in an environment that looked like an Andrew Wyeth painting. It's about as far from Southern California as you can get. But um, in the late 90s, I got a job on the LA Times writing about books for the book review, which sadly doesn't exist anymore. And I found myself coming out to LA with um, very pleasing frequency and really falling in love with it. And it's one of those places everyone, it's a cliche everyone talks about when they go to New York or Paris or Rome. It's kind of like, oh my God, it's just how I pictured it. Because you've seen it your entire life everywhere. In Los Angeles, it's in every movie, every TV show. When I was a kid, I used to love to watch the 60s iteration of Dragnet with Jack Webb and watch you know, Sergeant Joe Friday driving around LA. So when I got here, and I had been to LA before the late 90s, but there was something deeply familiar and also deeply intriguing. It felt to me like this is kind of the other, this like Western antipode to what New York is, this big malignant tumor of a city that's a big pain in the neck. And I was like, I love it. And the sun and the architecture. So I, having to come out for the annual LA Times book festival, an event much like this one, or to visit my editors, um, I was that kind of East Coast person, and there are a lot of us, I think, who would rent a convertible in February and crank the heat and, and you know, drive around town. I would drive, you know, accidentally on purpose past Brian Wilson's house up in Bel Air. I would be wanting to know, like, where was the Ferris Gallery on La Cienega? Where is that Richard Neutra Lovell Health House I've read about a million times? Right. I felt like I was always just kind of nosing around and being a real like sucker for yeah. Hollywood and for Los Angeles. And I think for some of my Angelino colleagues, I think they appreciated it and also just found it a little bit funny. So in terms of where my book came from, I, I started to develop this idea like, I really would like to write a, a kind of cultural history of Los Angeles. Being based in New York, you feel like the cultural side of the cultural history of Los Angeles and Hollywood often gets um, short shrift, you know? Uh, Editors, writers, publishers are all in New York, and they're not l looking out here as much as they, or they weren't 20, 25 years ago. But it took me a long time to figure out how to do that book. And, um, you know, I came to believe that the 60s were such an interesting period in Hollywood and in Los Angeles as a city. Um, I wanted to write about that period, and then by the by, it took about a million years for me to figure out the Dennis. Hopper and Brooke Hayward were really interesting characters to get into that time and to illuminate the art scene, the rock and roll scene, the counterculture, the politics, and eventually the emergence of the new Hollywood, um, which is what I put in my book. But I just found LA in the 60s to be such a fascinating time because of these 
you know, revolutions in visual art and music and in, in filmmaking. And it just seemed to also kind of illuminate uh, everywhere that we've been since then in terms of LA and Hollywood and what an interesting uh, place it is. And that there are also, I guess, a bigger uh, point to be made is that there are always stories out there that haven't been told yet about this place that maybe nobody knows about as much as we feel like we are also immersed in Hollywood. Well, what I would argue, uh, and one thing I love about your book in that period is that uh, the myth-making of Los Angeles as a Hollywood town, a company town, which makes it a town that's really a backwater in the mid-century, the 20s and the 30s, but a backwater of worldwide importance and influence, mm -hmm. was the iron grip of the studio bosses and the studio system that was established in the 20s and lasted through the mid-1950s. And that was a coherent system that was controlled by studio heads and publicists. And the actors were basically, as Albert Hitchcock once referred to them, cattle. Uh, they were really manipulated and their images were uh, created by uh, the studio heads and the writers and directors and, and the publicists. But in the period where Mark's writing about in his book, the studio system breaks down. And that's where you got to see, uh, I think, a, a more truer, uglier, and to uh, use a, a loaded word here, haywire, um, <laughs> depiction of, uh, of uh, that world. And I'm, I use the word haywire very purposely because that was the uh, memoir of Brooke Hayward, uh, who was writing about, in part, her movie star mother and her like super producer agent, was he an agent too? Uh, yeah. Super producer agent father, Leland Hayward. And she really was one of the first people to blow the lid off uh, the myths of Hollywood and the, the great you know, star and producer power couple, mm -hmm. uh, which her parents exemplified. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you want to pick up on that? And then uh, I, yeah. I can, we can throw it then to my, we quote, I'm a filmmaker, so I don't have a book to plug, but Scotty and the Secret History of Hollywood, yeah. which really blew the lid off <laughs> the system, which was about the great pimp and prostitute <laughs> to the movie stars. <laughs> Uh, who outed everybody posthumously, and I made a film about him. But first to well, uh, Leland Hayward. Well, well, sure. I mean, I love you know that you brought up Haywire. I mean, in some circles, Haywire is considered the greatest of all Hollywood memoirs. It's a book that Brooke Hayward um, wrote and was published in 1977. Uh, the now late Robert Gottlieb at Knopf um, edited the book. You know, the guy who brought you, you know, Toni Morrison and, and uh, Joseph Heller's Catch-22, etc. Robert Kara. I mean, she was in really good company as a writer, and this was hailed as a sort of Fitzgeraldian tale of growing up in Hollywood. And, you know, as I was researching my book, I would go back and find Life magazine portfolios of Leland Hayward and Margaret Sullivan and their three beautiful toe-headed children and their incredible faux colonial farmhouse in Brentwood with the velvety lawn and the swimming pool and the Americana furniture and the live-in nanny. And it was like, this was like the golden Hollywood family. I mean, beautiful, interesting, intelligent movie star, th arguably the first super agent, Leland Hayward, and these wonderful children, and they seemed to be bringing them up right. And the sun was always shining. Um, and their best friends were the Fondas. And um, then Hayward comes out in 1977, and it's really a kind of a harrowing tale of a peripatetic, bicoastal uh, family with not a lot of uh, love going on to extremely self-involved parents who don't have a lot of time for their children, that beautiful house on Evanston um, Road, right? In Brentwood, the parents had built this special outbuilding for the children. It was like a red, cute barn. What a great idea. The children can have their own little universe to live in and their toys can be in there and their gingham you know, quilts, each one color coded for the children and the nanny can be reading them stories. They can be riding their tricycles along the rugged <laughs> wooden floor of this place. Well, it turns out as Brooke wrote about it, as a kid, she's thinking, well, here I am at night and 
I'm in a different building that's 50 yards away from my house where my parents and their friends might be gathering or having a cocktail party and we are relegated to an outbuilding. And she would write, actually she wrote about this in the manuscript, I don't think it was in the final book, but I found it in the New York Public Library in her papers. She wrote about taking that long walk in the dark as a child and how absolutely terrifying and crushing it was. So, there, so Haywire kind of explores the cost of what it was to be a child in the golden Hollywood family of the 1940s. And, um, and you know, that memoir, I think, really had an impact on, on people. Uh, it turned into a really terrible uh, television movie. It might be ripe for a remake, I don't know. Well, there. There are several key moments. I think Haywire is one of them. I think Mommy Dearest is another one, where um, all of the uh, you know the publicity machine that went into making Joan Crawford. Make no mistake, Crawford was a, a brilliant uh, self-publicist and self-created uh, individual who put up a wonderful facade and really is a her career is just absolutely breathtaking. But that book told a um, you know a, a much darker tale. Uh, and whether you believe, there's a lot of talk about whether this was made up or not, and there was a big kind of counter narrative about it, but I, I tend to believe it. Uh, even the details of looking behind uh, the machinations of the studio heads and the publicists really is very revealing. Uh, and then I would say The Kid Stays in the Picture, which is the name of Bob Evans's autobiography, which having written an extensive profile of Evans and read the book very carefully, I can tell you is full of lies. Uh, but it all, <laughs> but it all, it's, it's one man's take on a particular moment in, in his bi biography, and he wanted to get the last word in. And it was a sort of surprise cult success. But if uh, an intelligent read of it, uh, or a sort of educated, uh, careful read of it, you can see where he's stitching things together and creating his own late life mythology, which I think is the point. That's, I go back to Sunset Boulevard uh, with that, which I think is really. People ask me my favorite movie all the time. I think that might be it of late. I just think Wilder um, really got at it there. Uh, that it was, you know, this was a really uh, carefully confected, brutal system that um, created uh, almost a sort of, uh, could create almost a sort of madness uh, within it, which I think is part of the allure continuing of, of this city because, um, you know, the gossip columns were part of it. So you had to kind of like the overworld view of it, which was very much put out by the publicity uh, machines and the fan magazines and like photo play. And then you had magazines like Confidential, which were reporting every, of course, it was delivered in a brown paper envelope and no one would ever admit to buying it, but its circulation was absolutely massive. So the population of the country was always getting sort of like the uber myth and then the kind of under myth. And I think that's one reason, the sort of the naughtiness of the suspected naughtiness of what was really going on and what was true about the myth making or not, I think is one thing that actually uh, made it a self-perpetuating machine. Eventually, uh, all these profiles I wrote and movies I made, which were frequently about the, the facades and, and the image, uh, I landed upon a figure uh, who was just absolutely almost too good to be true. Uh, and his, this was Scotty Bowers, who uh, I actually first heard about from another person I profiled, Merv Griffin, who was uh, not, uh, her, her, Merv Griffin was not heterosexual. Um, this is part of the myth making of, of the latter part of the 20th century. And he, he covered it up, he had a wife and a child, and uh, it was sort of an open secret that Merv was gay. I did a profile of him, you can go into Vanity Fair online and read it, and you can see it's late in his life, and he had been sued for sexual harassment by another male, and he was living with Ava Gabor in a kind of like sham marriage or sham relationship, and it was all absolutely like weird and intoxicating, and that's what I wrote about. But he told me about a gas station on a Hollywood Boulevard where the cars would be lined up around the corner and it wasn't for gas. Uh, they were there for prostitute to pick up prostitutes and there was a male madam named Scotty and I, this was 20 some years ago he told me about this. And then another kind of great figure of Hollywood, Gore Vidal, the author, um, who was a friend of mine, 
uh, told me one day, you know, I used to have a pimp. I was like, really? And he's like, yes, and he worked out of a gas station. And I was like, <laughs> wait a minute. I think Merv Griffin told me about this. And he said, oh, yes, yeah, Scotty. And I said, we still alive? He said, yes, he is. And then he called him up. And the next day, we had a meeting in Gore Vidal's living room. And uh, he began telling me all these stories about his love affairs with every superstar of the era, from Tyrone Power to Cary Grant to Vincent Price to, most shockingly of all, if you're a movie buff, Walter Pigeon, uh, <laughs> Mr. Miniver. Uh, <laughs> And women, too, and fixing up Katherine Hepburn with uh, 400 sex dates with women. Uh, and I, all of it kind of defied credulity, except when I began to research it, it all panned out. And Vidal, who was president at the time, began to confirm it for me. So eventually, I ended up making a movie, and Scotty is, was still alive when I made it. He only recently died at the age of 97. Uh, and he really uh, told what I thought was, I called it the secret history of Hollywood, but in many ways I think it's the real history of Hollywood. It's the counter narrative of the city, which I found endlessly fascinating. Because I think at this late date, there's no point in buying into any mythologies. There's no point in buying into what we read in the Daily Mail online. Uh, you, know, you can choose to read that or not, and believe it or not, and be titillated by it or not, or vaguely interested, or ignore it. But this was from the horse's mouth, so to speak. This is someone who was literally a protector of the reputations of these movie stars who were so constricted by the studio system that had made them rich and famous that they couldn't live authentic lives. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the story I, I told in that. Uh, and uh, it was really the riddle wrapped inside the enigma, the story that kept on giving. I'm still finding out things uh, when I read books and put pieces together that confirm things that he told me. but. Um, I, I think that that's really what it continues to fascinate me about uh, the ecosystem that was established 100 years ago now, uh, really more, by the, the Jewish fur traders, basically, who had moved west and started the studios. And somehow, with all the technological revolutions we've had uh, and all the, the disruptions, uh, this still is a worldwide phenomenon that really uh, is, penetrates the consciousness of uh, anyone with access to now uh, a cell phone. Yeah, um, Matt, I, I'm such a fan of your movie about Scotty, and it, it, it is such a great example of being able to tell generally untold stories in, in Hollywood and to give us a sense of something that is happening behind the facade. I mean, I just think of the way in the film that you establish this Richland service station on Hollywood Boulevard as being a locus of this louche demimonde of a, you know, this under the radar Hollywood sex trade. Um, there's something positively delightful in a way <laughs> about this, you know, feeling like you're being you know, shown the secret world that's existing in Hollywood. And there's something about, as I talk about in my book, the service station becomes a very potent symbol because they're everywhere in Hollywood. My characters, Dennis and Brooke, had that famous uh, Ed Ruscha painting, uh, Standard Station Amarillo, Texas, in the den of their room. Uh, Dennis's most famous photograph is called Double Standard, and it actually also depicts a uh, standard station at that uh, multi-valent uh, cor um, corner. Where is it? It's like Santa Monica, Doheny, and Melrose, where they come together. There's a Petco there now. Um, so when I saw that, there was something that was so rich symbolically about the, pardon the pun, the Richland service station, but also it was just so deeply Hollywood. It kind of reminded me in a way, uh, some of this is what we're talking about. There was a fantastic book of photographs, some of you guys probably know about it, it came out in 1939 by John Swope called Camera Over Hollywood. Has anyone seen this book? It's brilliant. And Matt, do you know, do you know the don't Camera know. Over Hollywood? It's one of these books that to me articulates that sunshine and noir quality that Hollywood and Los Angeles share. That's something that I think is very much part of the allure for many of us. You kind of get that in Nathaniel West, of course, and, and Raymond Chandler, that noirish dark side, and then there's the, the dappled sunny stuff. But the photographs show various movie stars at work and play, but also these sort of wannabe players who are going on cattle calls or weird pictures of Hollywood Boulevard. 
<clears throat> and to me, there was something about Scotty Bowers and his world going back to, um, was this going back to the 40s or 50s at the service station? 45, right. Yeah, the it's very much a part of that world. And there is something deeply strange and attractive about finding these um, these kind of ancillary narratives that go along with everything that we know from watching all the, ho the classic Hollywood films and reading the standard biographies that I think uh, offers a tremendous kind of seduction or allure in storytelling. And if there's sort of more points of contact between, let's say, that particular project of Matt's, because he's done so many, um, and my book is that in the way that Scotty allowed Matt to talk about, you know, Charles Lawton or Cole Porter or Catherine Hepburn, a whole Hollywood scene, through Dennis and Brooke, I was able to talk about you know, the Fondas or uh, the Birds, you know, the band, or artists like Ed Ruscha or Andy Warhol, um, just a whole scene. And you find these little untold stories or characters who haven't had the spotlight on them. They can just kind of illuminate uh, an entire era, an entire milieu for you. And I found that very powerful with the Scotty movie. Yeah, it, interesting back to the service station. And one thing about Los Angeles that I love is that it is by turns staggeringly beautiful and just breathtakingly ugly. Uh, the kind of push-pull contradiction, the sunshine versus film noir, those contradictions I think make it more interesting than uh, more coherent cities that are almost twee uh, in their you know striving for perfection. LA is... Uh, um, I think built on a kind of fake myth and uh, it's really an acquired taste and I think it's a, a city of immigrants and self-selectors. Uh, mm. And one of the, as you point out, like, like there's no, it's not a walking city. So there, there are two piazzas in LA. The two piazzas of Los Angeles are the supermarkets. That's a piazza. And the other one are the gas stations, which is a piazzetta, a small piazza. <laughs> Uh, and that's where you see people. So you see people at Gelson's or uh, Jensen's uh, or Bristol Farm or, or you know, Stater Brothers. Uh, and you, you sort of get a different population in each of these places. I know I thought that was funny too. Uh, and, and I mean, some supermarkets are actually pickup supermarkets. Uh, if you want to know one of the Whole Foods in, uh, on La Brea in LA, if you want to head there. Uh, and um, some gas stations, it turned out, were pickup gas stations. Uh, and uh, based on, like, since the pandemic, I've noticed pulling into a few gas stations, the gas stations again seem to be pickup gas stations, by the way, which I hadn't noticed uh, in recent decades in LA. So that's odd and interesting. Um, but uh, the reason for the gas station is absolutely integral to the structure of the city itself. And Scotty, who was, street smart, but not a book smart and not an educated person, understood this. And that's why he uh, put up stakes at the Richfield Station on Hollywood Boulevard and Van Ness uh, in 1945. And the reason was that uh, with the exception of 20th Century Fox, almost all of the studios were a little to the east of that, or a little to the north or a little to the south. So when the studio people, who mostly at that time lived west of there in Beverly Hills, West Hollywood, onward to the ocean, would come home, it was convenient for them to pass through uh, that area. So this was a sort of uh, very good economic and business model decision that he made by uh, setting, up, uh, setting up shop at the station. Uh, the station was a kind of normal gas station. He wasn't the owner of it. He was the uh, kind of afternoon to overnight employee of a man named Bill Booth, who'd owned the gas station and lived far away in Manhattan Beach and would leave, and of course, way pre-cell phone. Uh, so he had no idea what was going on there. But uh, after a few weeks of Scotty being hired, Bill Booth said, Scotty, what are you doing? I'm like, these receipts have never been higher. You know? <laughs> and uh, it became a real going concern that Many people who were over a certain age whom I spoke to, absolutely, if you mentioned the gas station, uh, would fess up and say, yeah, I knew that gas station. When, I, when Scotty came out here to do uh, a premiere of the movie at the uh, film festival, 
we were walking down Palm Canyon, and I, literally I felt like people were leaping out of storefronts and stopping him, and they were old friends or clients or whatever, uh, saying like, my God, Scotty, I haven't seen you in so long. That gas station was the greatest thing ever in my life. Uh, and he used to say, oh, people tell me that all the time, and I'd say, I don't believe you. And then it, I saw it happening, actually. <laughs> Uh, and I also have to say, the more unbelievable the story he told me, the more uh, I was able to confirm it, ultimately. I mean, it was just absolutely astonishing. In fact, I'll share one thing that I didn't believe. Uh, it's not particularly salacious, but it was so odd. He said, so Scotty was born in 1923, and it was a story about Paris Hilton, who was born probably in the 90s or something, or the late 80s, and he said, oh, you know, I was Paris Hilton's babysitter. I was like, that makes, that's insane. Why would a wealthy family hire an 85-year-old male prostitute to be the babysitter of their children? Um, they said, oh, yeah, Rick and Kathy, the parents, and oh, I went back to Conrad. I used to pimp out people to Conrad Hill, and that's the grandfather. Um, and then stories about Zsa, Zsa Gabor and whether her child was really Conrad's child or, um, or Barron's child, who was Conrad's son. I mean, it was getting very convoluted about the Hiltons. In any event, uh, we were at a, uh, he, Scotty was invited to Elton John's Oscar party uh, one year, which was a big event. We're seated, seated in this giant tent with a thousand people and arriving late was Paris Hilton who walks through this entire full party and out of a thousand people sees Scotty Bowers and runs over to him and sat on his lap and started kissing him and saying, this man was my babysitter. <laughs> Now, that's the cleanest story I can tell you about Scotty Bowers, actually. <laughs> but it was true. Yeah. Anyway. I, lo I love that story. And there's so many stories that emerge in the, in the film itself. And then Scotty's um, partner toward the end of his life, I can't remember her name. Lois. Lois. At some point, there's a marvelous moment. I'm glad you chose it for your edit. She says something, because there's this kind of conversation is going on throughout the film, and you're hearing about Cary Grant, and you're hearing about Walter Pigeon, and you're hearing, you know, all these kind of hair-curling stories of this Hollywood, you know, sexy underworld, let's say. And Lois says something like, I don't know, I'm just not really that interested in Hollywood or Hollywood stories. Um, that is a certain kind of person, right? Well, I think it said a lot about a marriage, which is, I think the film is in part about a marriage. Uh, and she's a very conventional person who apparently didn't know about his past or didn't want to know. And meanwhile, he was still turning tricks while they were married at, you know, like a very advanced age. Uh, so, uh, but I, I, another thing about the real Los Angeles, which again is the Los Angeles behind the facade. So that can operate at a very high, grand level like the Mommy Dearest narrative. Uh, and you could pick a million of them uh, from that period, like, um, I don't know. Like, and just name any star. I mean, Charles Lawton's a great one. Uh, I mean, you know, mar married to Elsa Lanchester, both incredibly successful and very well thought of British actor couple. Mm -hmm. And they, she, living double lives, and Lawton was a, a voracious consumer of male prostitutes and had very, if you believe Scotty had, and I do, but had like very, very uh, outre uh, sexual proclivities, which one doesn't want to think about. But, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, the end of Scotty's career, uh, and this was the underside, this is for me the real Hollywood. His last great patron was a guy who had been in Roger Corman movies named Beach Dickerson, who, like many an actor who come to Los Angeles, uh, stopped acting at a certain t uh, point because it didn't work out, and he became a house flipper um, in the 50s. And he ended up owning the entire mountaintop of a part of Laurel Canyon. So there were 20 little houses up there, and he rented those houses to out-of-work actors. Among them were Jennifer Aniston, for instance. Uh, in fact, the house just, you can look it up in the Daily Mail, the house just sold. The, the lead story in the Daily Mail was Jennifer Aniston's, you know, poverty house sells once owned by famous male prostitute. Uh, so uh, it's still being covered, it's still of interest, but it, it was fascinating to me that Scotty became kind of like the handyman and the sort of surrogate husband of this man, Beach Dickerson, who was a wealthy man, 
uh, in Hollywood, but not through Hollywood. He was a wealthy man in a very traditional business, which was renting cheap housing to the workers of the town. And uh, that's where Scotty insinuated and supported himself for 20 or 30 years by doing that. And um, the, that for me was, a, aside from the like, glamorous, very attention-getting names that I mentioned, the, the quotidian life of Scotty and the people you didn't know about who you met in this narrative were for me actually a portrait of the city that was a more legitimate portrait of the city. And these are the actors who are not famous. These are the carpenters. These are the musicians. These are the choreographers who are not household names, who were all friends of Scotty. If they were gay, they usually knew him because you couldn't be overtly gay at the time. So he was a, a kind of safe way to, he was like grinder, pre-grinder, uh, I suppose. It was maybe even a little safer than grinder because he actually had the human connection. And uh, that was, he, 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 you don't know what grinder is? I'll tell you in a second. Uh, <laughs> um, that uh, he um, served a sort of a purpose. He really performed a service that was very interesting. Uh, grinder is a hookup site for your um, your iPhone. Yeah. It, has, it has supplanted the service station in some ways. It, it, it has, has a, yeah. Well, this is a connector. Yeah, I mean, there's a sociological point to be made there, which I'll, I'll just reemphasize because. Um, it's, it's sort of awkward to talk about this sometimes because you're talking about salacious things that are very gossipy, but I really do feel there's a real foundational thing here. Yeah. And I, I built the narrative upon this, which this, this is happening in an era when uh, homosexuality is illegal, and if you were signed up in the Hollywood studio system, your career would be ruined if you were out. And uh, that was really the, the motivation and the, what drove the economy of that part of the underworld. Uh, so he actually was performing a, a kind of service that was necessary for a city that had to, by necessity, live a double life. Yeah, and it's clear, I think, if, it, when, you, when you see the movie and you think about Scotty, the, the salaciousness uh, of the story is in service of something broader, which is to illuminate this hidden world that you illuminate so well. And it's another example of telling a Hollywood story that is a little bit, you know, just slightly over here on the margins that then seems to illuminate the whole. I very much felt that way when I was writing about Brooke and Dennis that I was able to show this more bohemian culture, uh, culture vulture side of Hollywood that's often forgotten about where people like Andy Warhol and uh, Marcel Duchamp are, are flitting through. Um, you know, there's uh, occasional flashes of, of salaciousness as well, I guess, in my narrative, although it wasn't really the, um, exactly the focus, but you know, this was a during also during the era of the sexual revolution, and strange things were were certainly happening. Um, and it was interesting to me to kind of look at the split between how men and women experienced that time, because I had a female character and a male character, and they um, and they were married, and they were a very uh, creative, collaborative, but ultimately combustible. A uh, couple encountering this crazy era of social change, and um, you know the sexual revolution didn't really you know divide its rewards uh, equally bet between them. It's certainly the case that when I was spending a week or so in Dennis Hopper's photographic archive, um, combing through the 18,000 images that Dennis took in the 60s, that every once in a while there would just be a, a photograph that could only really be described as unknown. Uh, unclothed female, you know, in, in there. Um, there. The degree of intimacy one finds when one starts going through um, the stuff of someone who's not around anymore sometimes is very stunning uh, and, and um, striking. So it was an interesting project for me insofar as, you know, Brooke is still around uh, discussing her marriage with her. You know, I found that as a writer, I think Robert Pinsky said this, to, um, the poet and writer, you know, to write about a marriage is to really uh, have to confront um, a lot of mystery. And, you know, so I felt like I had to proceed rather tactfully <laughs> in some of these areas. Um, with Brooke, it made for very interesting kind of conversations to have and to review um, that relationship. But, um, also, I think gratifying to get back to the original point of finding uh, new stories in Hollywood, which makes me wonder. I mean, are, I would hope that we'll be able to continue to discover new stories about Hollywood that haven't been told. Um, 
And Matt, I'm just curious for you as a writer and as a filmmaker, like how do you, and I know you have various projects on the go right now, but how do you know when you have a project? Like what is the thing that kind of captures your repertorial desire or filmmaking desire to tell a story? Are there certain things that grab you? I, for a film, usually it's a story that everyone thinks they know, but they don't really know. Uh, and I, if I have that sensation, then I'll, I'll pursue it. I, I think for journalism, it's just exclusivity. Is the, for the type, type of journalism you and I do, yeah. uh, um, that's very important, yeah. actually. Yeah, for sure. um, but I feel like uh, I've learned a turning point with a very disruptive point for Hollywood right now. The big screen is, I hate to say it, dead. Uh, when I started making movies not that long ago, I made them for the big screen very explicitly. I have a garage full of film prints from my first few mm -hmm. films. Um, and the pandemic has really um, put an end to that era. But storytelling, no. Storytelling is alive and well, and uh, it will always exist. And uh, also, uh, uh, people lying about uh, their lives and <laughs> creating myths about their lives. <laughs> Uh, will always persist, and uh, that's why we need journalism and uh, people who are uh, uh, interpreters of the culture rather than just uh, the purveyors of the culture. Such is the allure of Hollywood.